G'day and welcome to Redriven. Now, before we get into this, a quick apology about the audio. It is pouring with rain outside and we can't control the weather. Anyway, welcome to part three of our top five iconic cars that you can afford to buy. If you haven't seen parts one and two, hit pause now and go and watch part one because it explains a lot of the rules. Speaking of rules, look, we love all of the comments and recommendations that we're getting, but again, we're, we're trying to keep this as affordable as possible. So we're gonna set around about 150,000 Aussie dollars as the upper limit because even that's a fair chunk of money to spend on a car for most of us. And remember, just because it's iconic doesn't necessarily mean it has to be fast, exciting, or even good. Look, yeah, some of the cars that we featured and that we will be featuring are pretty plain and boring, and some of them are even a bit shit. But remember, iconic doesn't mean good. Some of the best cars ever made have been completely forgotten. Like, say, the pop-up headlight Honda Prelude. I miss Preludes. And also, again, even though this list is in numerical order, there's no winner as such. All of these cars are iconic in their own special way. Anyway, look, kicking things off, we really wanted to have the original Audi Quattro, but they're so bloody rare these days, and the really good examples are far from affordable. So instead, we're going with another rally-inspired weapon that has changed the world. It's the Subaru Impreza WRX. Now, this might be a, a little bit specific to the Australian market, but look, yes, while there were a host of other turbocharged all-wheel drive rally-bred cars that came before the WRX, even Subaru's own Liberty and Legacy RS, for example, it's the WRX that took the biggest swing at changing the automotive landscape, especially for those that enjoy their cars being a fair bit spicier than others. See, before the WRX came along, and we're assuming this is the case for much of the world, if you wanted a fast, affordable, and practical car, it just had to be a V8. Here in Australia, it was generally either a Ford Falcon or a Holden Commodore, but whatever it was, fast meant eight cylinders. Our police highway patrol cars were V8s, and the cars that they chased from illegal street races were also V8s. The V8 was king. Granted, before the WRX, there was a small minority of people that appreciated smaller turbocharged cars, and the V8 brigade conveniently ignored that a Lancer GSR or a Celica GT4 was faster in the real world, but when the WRX landed in the mid-90s, everything changed. See, back then, not only was the WRX appreciated by this small group of rally fans, our capital city's criminals and organized crime gangs embraced this little pocket rocket, especially in hatch or wagon form, as their go-to form of transport to violently reverse through the front doors of, say, a jewelry or an electronics store, fill up the boot with as much stuff as they could, and then race away, consistently outrunning the cops in their V8 highway patrol cars. Nothing builds iconography like a notorious reputation, and the WRX with its ability to embarrass everything from V8 muscle cars to European exotics not only transformed Subaru's image from being that odd little brand from Japan, but to being a serious player and a high quality car manufacturer. It changed the attitudes of the general public in terms of what a performance car even is. And we haven't even touched on its rally success or competition pedigree. The WRX rapidly accelerated the growth of the import car scene, especially in terms of tuning and performance. It brought fans of small capacity turbocharged cars out from the shadows and turned vehicles that were once the minority into mainstream machines of desire. Many argue that it was the WRX that inspired Volkswagen to make the Golf R32, which then became the Golf R, and that the WRX is the car that paved the way for all performance oriented yet affordable import cars to be taken seriously. These days, here in Australia, around about $5,000 will get you behind the wheel of, say, a, a high kilometre 2000 to 2002 WRX, but at that price, it's gonna be very tired. And at the other end of the spectrum, around $140,000 to $150,000 will get you into a truly iconic two-door GC8 STI. Okay, next up, it's the vehicle that may very well be responsible for one of the most despised category of cars out there, it's the luxury SUV, and it's the Range Rover. To make things a little bit more palatable for many of you, we're not referring to modern Range Rovers, but to the Range Rover Classic from the early 70s to the mid 90s. The Range Rover really was the car that could do it all. It had, and for many examples, still has remarkable off-road ability, yet it's also as refined and smooth riding as many luxury cars, thanks to its soft, supple suspension. Even the way that it effortlessly wafts along with an air of refined conviction, thanks to its very English V8 power plant, perhaps 
Land Rover didn't realize what a genius product they'd created. Even though the aesthetics from the very beginning managed to bring a real elegance to such a bulky vehicle, initially the Range Rover was offered in pretty basic trim. Yet every time a more luxurious version was launched, it quickly became the best-selling version, setting the trend for all luxury SUVs to come. Over the decades that followed, Range Rover as a brand has... Uh unfortunately become more of an urban status symbol rather than a true off-roading one, thanks to many owners considering tough terrain to equate to speed bumps in a shopping center car park. But there's no denying that the Range Rover Classic still perfectly blends luxury with ruggedness and showed that utility doesn't need to contradict sophistication. If anything, it enhances it. Land Rover still sells various versions of the Range Rover, but the original version is still the one to get. Like, talk to anyone who has ever owned one of these things, and you'll see their face light up, even though their wallet may have been beaten to a pulp in keeping it on the road. Yes, there were SUVs before the Range Rover, even a few comfortable ones, but when it comes to setting the standard for the plethora of luxury SUVs that now infest this little planet, the Range Rover Classic was genius. Getting behind the wheel of a Range Rover Classic these days, here in Australia, you're gonna need anywhere from $5,000 to $110,000. Obviously a $5,000 Range Rover will actually cost you far more than that, but don't be fooled into thinking that the outlaying of cash will end even if you buy a mint condition $110,000 example. It's a Range Rover. It's always going to cost you money. Okay, next up it is something completely different. It's the Volkswagen Type 2, or the Combi, or the Microbus, or the Transporter. As arguably the most significant forerunner to modern cargo and passenger vans, the Volkswagen Type 2 isn't just iconic, it's one of the most important vehicles in history. And speaking of history, back in the late 1940s and after seeing the sales success of the Type 1, or the Beetle as it's far more commonly known, Volkswagen recognised the need for a commercial vehicle and developed the Type 2. Initial tests of early prototypes in the wind tunnel produced atrocious results. Basically, Volkswagen had made a brick on wheels, and due to this, the split window design was born. This split windscreen, along with a few other changes, reduced drag by more than 30%, actually making the Type 2 more aerodynamic than its smaller and older sibling, the Beetle. Initially from launch in 1949, the Type 2 was produced in two variations, the commercial van and the combi people mover, while it wasn't until a year later that the globally loved microbus rolled off the assembly line. And thanks to its incredible popularity, since then over a dozen variations have been offered over its 63-year lifespan, resulting in over 1.5 million examples being produced. Fast forward 10 years or so into the 1960s and 70s, and thanks to its low prices, high availability, and funky good looks, it became the transport representation of freedom and the counterculture attitudes of the hippie movement, commonly being used to transport hippies to anti-war protests all over the world. Even musicians of the era embraced the Type 2 as an icon, with Bob Dylan's album The Free Willin' featuring a VW bus on the cover, while the Grateful Dead were famously followed by a convoy of Type 2s while touring. And while undoubtedly synonymous with the arts and the world's cultural movements, the car kept on proving itself as a capable workhorse across the globe, being produced in Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, and even here in Australia during its lifespan, it eventually left the various factories as a panel van, a passenger van, a double and single cab pickup truck, and away from Volkswagen's intentions, it was modified to fit any kind of purpose. It can actually be argued that the Type 2 wasn't just the precursor to all modern vans, but it may have helped set the direction for our current crop of utes and pickups. These days, getting behind the wheel here in Australia will cost you anywhere from fifteen dollars to $20,000. However, at that price, it will most likely be in pretty rough condition and in desperate need of some TLC. And at the other end of the spectrum, $100,000 to $120,000 will get you into something very, very special. Now, speaking of iconic automotive shapes and things that are boxy, next up it is the Volvo 200 series. The 200 series isn't classically beautiful, it was never incredibly fast, even in 242 GT or turbo form, and while enjoyable to drive, it certainly didn't set the world alight with its handling dynamics, obviously excluding the flying brick race cars. But the 200 series Volvo arguably established itself from early on as the perceived safest car ever, setting Volvo up as a brand leader in automotive safety. By the time production wrapped up in 1993, after nearly two decades of Volvo 
pumping out these boxy wonders, more than 2.8 million had been built, setting up the 200 series as Volvo's most iconic car. Design-wise, many believe that the Volvo 200 is as instantly as recognizable as being a Volvo as a 911 is at being a Porsche, especially when in wagon or 245 body style. Actually, speaking of the wagon variants, these were the longest European wagons in production at the time, and with safety being a priority selling point, the optional rearward facing jump seats, which made the car into a seven seater, had full three point seat belts. And the rearmost compartment had special chassis strengthening so that those passengers wouldn't be disadvantaged in a crash from the back. Plus about a third of all 200 series Volvos built were wagons, or estates if you want to be fancy. Volvos were boxy before the 200 series with the likes of the 140 series, but the 200 appeared like only straight rulers were allowed in the design process. This boxy design was a classic example of form following function, with the body having to incorporate safety features like larger bumpers, and the inclusion of a feature that was to become a car making industry safety standard, crumple zones. But the 200 series wasn't just a safety tour de force, they had electronic fuel injection. And in 1977, Volvo introduced a special sensor in the 200 series that allowed incredibly precise management of the fuel to air mixture in relation to emissions and fuel efficiency, further enhancing its environmentally friendly reputation. The 200 series may not have been the first car to feature disc brakes or three point seat belts or a reinforced chassis, but there's equally no doubt that we wouldn't have every other car manufacturer selling safety as its prime ethos if the 200 series hadn't existed. To get behind the wheel of one of these cubist icons these days, here in Australia, pricing kicks off from around about $10,000 with really mint condition and rarer examples asking around about $20,000. We should mention that these 200 series Volvos were over-engineered to like crazy levels and they can be really reliable because they were built to last, which is something that it has in common with our next car, it's the Toyota Corolla. Humble might just be the perfect word for the Corolla. Look, it might not be the fastest or the most luxurious car in its class. Over its 12 generations, it's rarely been the most highly equipped or even offered the latest in technology when compared to its direct competition. But it has always stuck true to its original mantra set by its chief engineer Tetsuo Hasegawa back in the 1960s, that the Corolla must bring happiness and well-being to people around the world. It brought happiness thanks to its reliability. It will rarely, if ever, break down, and across every generation has maintained its reputation for proven reliability and endurance. Sure, over its lifetime it may not have been the cheapest car in its class, but the Corolla has always offered excellent value for money, and it retains its value incredibly well on the used market. But the Corolla not only defined what this car segment is meant to be, it also achieves iconic status thanks to its popularity. The Corolla is the world's highest selling car, with Toyota shifting over 50 million Corollas over its 56 year lifespan. Plus the Corolla improves with each new incarnation, generally setting the standard for what consumers expect and what the industry must deliver in new cars. It can also be argued that while the Corolla is only one model in the Toyota lineup, its ability to attract millions of customers is what gave Toyota such a solid foundation to become the world's largest automaker. This dominance strengthened the entire Japanese manufacturing sector and inspired South Korea to follow suit. What you'll need to budget to buy one will vary dramatically, obviously depending on the year, the generation, mileage, condition, and about a million other factors. The cheapest Corolla that we'd actually recommend buying, obviously one that is registered to drive on the road and hasn't been abused, would be a mid to late 90s example with hopefully under 250,000 kilometers on it and a full service history. And it'll be asking around about $2,000 or at the other end of the pricing spectrum, around about 35,000 Aussie dollars will land you in a mint condition 2020 Corolla ZR, or maybe a fully restored concourse condition 1960s example. Now we still have a couple more episodes of this iconic but affordable series to go, and we wanna know, what do you guys think should make up parts four and five? Let us know in those comments. Oh, also, while you're at it, can you hit those like, subscribe, and bell buttons if you're enjoying our videos, and please share Redriven as much as you can, because the more that you share Redriven, the more of these videos we can make and hopefully that's a good thing. See you next time. Here we go. 2002 W. That was good until then until I f***ed it. Established itself from 1993 nearly come on dickhead competition. 
got to remember to breathe. At the other end of the spiking, spiking spectrum, spiking spectrum, spiking spectrum. And while enjoyable to drive, it certainly didn't set the world alight with its. <laughs>